Okay, hello and welcome back everyone to Grockets OG TV. While I try and get my pen up, there we go. Grockets OG TV, my name's Jim Jacobson, like it says right there. I'll make a smiley face out of that. And you're on Grocket.com. We are on the 12th edition of the guide, and this is the last broadcast of the 12th edition of the guide. We've gone through every question that has an answer in the entire book, or will have at the end of today's broadcast. And... Um, yeah, we've finished up the sentence correction section. Uh, of course, we do still have to do whatever it is, eight more questions or so. Um, and <clears throat> and I, it's been a pleasure to be able to uh, talk, talk through these problems with you. Anyway, uh, there is no good reason not to get started. <clears throat> so we pick up on page 682 with question number 133. And as before, as always, you do need to have a copy of the book in front of you to get the most out of this. There's, um, you know, uh, a lot more that you can get out of this by seeing this in text as well as what I read to you out loud. And, um, yeah, I guess that's all I'll say about that, too. So last week, local shrimpers held a news conference to take some credit for the resurgence of the rare Kemp's Ridley turtle, saying that their compliance with laws requiring that turtle excluder devices be on shrimp nets protect adult sea turtles. Okay. So again, we always try to make predictions about what sorts of things might be issues on this particular sentence before we hit the answer choices. It is in your best interest to do so because... Um, just having, having, number one, the act of predicting gets, keeps your mind focused on the sentence. It, it keeps you from going to the answer choices without doing a little paraphrasing about what the sentence is about. Also, that, that kind of mental filter, that prediction that you do, acts as a filter uh, to um, cause wrong answer choices to uh, jump out at you more. I should say that that's actually just been my experience. It's possible that your experience is totally the reverse. If you find that taking the time to predict dramatically reduces your accuracy dramatic dramatically reduces your accuracy i'm not going to accuse you of doing it wrong i will just say don't do that anymore you know man goes into the doctor and says doctor it hurts when i do this and the doctor says well don't do that you know it is about what is what makes you successful on the gmat so um you know and everyone is different and not every strategy works equally well so um right back to these the the issues then um one are the that's, you know, we've seen before on the GMAT um, that the GMAT prefers that you not have a series of that's in a row, saying that their compliance with laws requiring that turtle excluder devices. So that's one thing that the GMAT is down on. It's not grammatically incorrect, but it's potentially unclear. The second one that jumps out at me is the subject of this main clause, you know, saying that their compliance... Their, their compliance with laws and then everything from with laws requiring blah, blah, blah is all just modifying compliance. The verb that goes with compliance, if I spell it correctly, is actually protect. And, of course, if you put it like that, compliance protect is a subject verb mismatch. It should be compliance protects. <clears throat> and compliance is in the non-underlined portion, so uh, an answer needs to have protects rather than protect. So answer choice A is wrong uh, on that basis. And what else do we have? Um, so we do have this word uh, requiring. Um, if we are going to say that uh, the laws require that turtle excluder devices be on shrimp nets, um, require that we'll have the subjunctive. Which answer choice does have correctly, uh, correctly appearing in its answer. Uh, and we can do the sentence without using require that. But um, if we do have that, we need to have the correct use of the subjunctive. So those are my predictions. Um, let's go. A we already know is wrong for it has the couple that's and then it has the subject verb mismatch, which is the big issue. Uh, choice B. Uh, saying that their compliance with laws requiring turtle excluder devices on shrimp nets is protecting. Okay. Um, the compliance is protecting. That is a valid subject verb match. 
and um, we've gotten rid of one of the that's too in choice B. So uh, and, and and since it, it, we've actually gotten rid of this that, the one that would require the subjunctive, so um, we don't have to have that there. So choice B is an option for the correct answer. Uh, choice C, their compliance with laws that require turtle excluder devices on shrimp nets protect. So there we have that subject verb mismatch again. It should be protects with an S on the end. Uh, D, <clears throat> Compliance with laws to require turtle excluder nets on well, yeah. to require turtle excluder devices on shrimp nets are protecting. Well, compliance are protecting is totally not going to do it. Also, there's this to require business. By saying that they the compliance with laws to require um, turtle excluder devices. Remember, the infinitive is used to express purpose. I did it to, um, oh, I can't even think of it. Um, I went to the store to get more milk, okay? To get more milk was my purpose, and I used the infinitive to express purpose. Here, laws to require turtle excluder devices sounds like the intent of the law. The point of the law is to, in, is to require turtle excluder devices. While, of course, that's the effect of the law, the intent of the law is to protect the the Kemp's Ridley turtle. So this to require thing actually kind of changes the meaning of the sentence. And on top of that, it has that subject verb mismatch. Um, choice E still has to require. It corrects the subject verb mismatch, but to require on its own is enough to make E not as cool as answer choice B. Again, uh, compliance with laws requiring turtle excluder devices on shrimp nets is protecting. That's also the most concise answer, as is often the case. Um, the GMAT really does nudge you in the direction of concision. So not a big surprise, but we've had plenty where the wordiest answer was the correct one. So anyway, pleasant to see our general um, principle of concision upheld with number 133. All right, 6, 8, 2, 1, 3, 4. Recently implemented shift work equations based on studies of the human sleep cycle have reduced sickness, sleeping on the job, fatigue among shift workers, and have raised produ production efficiency in various industries. So, oh my gosh, it's a list. We haven't had one of these in a while. Lists, of course, to me, feel like a big um, a gift. You know, you get them on the GMAT. It's like, aha, here's something that I can really easily break down. Uh, this one actually is a little bit tricky, though. Um, because we actually have two different things going on. We have have reduced, and so the things that they've reduced, or that they, yes, shift work equations have reduced. They've reduced sickness, they have reduced sleeping, and they have reduced fatigue. And remember, the final item on a list in a list of things needs to have and in front of it, no matter how many you actually have. So if you have two things, and has to go before the second one. If you have three things, and goes before the third one. If you have 20, it goes before the 20th one, but probably you shouldn't be listing them in narrative format. Luckily, there are no GMAT questions where they list 20 things, but, you know, a business memo could conceivably. You are better off simply including the list. Anyway, good story, and goes before the final item. Choice A does not have that. It has an and before the final item, but there we've actually shifted what we're listing. We first are listing the things that um, the shift work equations have reduced. They also have raised uh, production efficiency. And you can't have the and before that as the last item because it's actually the beginning of a separate set of parallelism. In theory, there could have actually been another two or more things that were raised by uh, shift work equations, and you would need an and before the final item in that list. Now, since have raised only has one item in the list, um, there's no and here. because it's a, one, a list of one item. However, um, then we have two verbs that have been performed by these shift work equations. We have have reduced sickness, sleeping, 
and then because we have a, a list, we need and before the third item in the list. And then we also have, um, so the reason I drew this arrow from this and to here is uh, because this and is the, uh, the last list item and. That does not go before have. However, we do need a separate and here because there are two verbs. We, we have a list of two verbs that uh, shift work equations have done. They have reduced and, and have raised production efficiency. Okay, so we need two ands in the sentence, one before the final item in this list, and then one joining the two verbs that have happened. Choice A doesn't do that, and that's what the correct answer will need to have. That So uh, just looking at the list, again, mastering lists isn't going to get you to 800 necessarily on the GMAT, but when these do come up, these should be or can be some of the easier ones because the rules are pretty clear. Um, anyway, so let's find the right and. Okay, maybe we should number these. We'll name this guy and number one. I'll put it in green, actually. And number one needs to come before fatigue if that's the because when it's the third item in its own list. And then this guy will be and number two, the and that joins the two verbs have reduced and have raised. Okay. So choice A, of course, is wrong. Um, and so oh, and uh, also, of course, we have to keep our, be open to other, you know, interpretations. If we are going to do the list in this format, this is what needs to happen. Choice B, um, uh, reduce sickness, sleeping on the job, and fatigue among, sh uh, oh, sorry, that's no, B, fatigue among shift workers and raised. So we get and number two, but not and number one. Is And number one is missing. Choice C, um, sleeping on the job and fatigue among shift workers while raising production efficiency in various industries. So choice C is interesting. Instead of having and number two and then having have raised, it's changed it to while, which is a, a contrasting word indicating that, you know, these have redu it's reduced these things while raising these, you know, it's uh, contrast and uh, at the same time. So it doesn't actually require the second and at all, um, which is potentially clearer. You know, remember the GMAT, even just on the previous question, doesn't like having multiple that's close together. Multiple ands can muddy what your lists are actually like. So, um, you know, it's conceivable that choice C is correct, even though it doesn't fit our prediction of uh, what the correct answer would look like. Uh, choice D. Uh, it, it's missing and number one. We need an and before fatigue because that's the last of the things that has been reduced. And um, choice E, and fatigue among shift, lower, shift workers was lowered while raising. So choice E looks very similar to choice C. And again, so it looks like no correct answer will have matched our prediction. And sometimes that will happen. Um, but our prediction still told us what the key issues were, namely that we needed to separate our two lists, our things that were reduced and our things that were raised. Anyway, we have to decide between C and D and fatigue among shift. Uh, so uh, remember the, the first thing that's coming before, t for f before fatigue is reduced. So um, reduced sickness, sleeping on the job and fatigue among shift workers while raising production efficiency or reduced sickness, sleeping on the job, and fatigue among shift workers was lowered. So there we actually um, can see what the problem is with E. Instead of this parallelism of have reduced sickness, sleeping, and fatigue, choice E says have reduced sickness, um, sleeping, and fatigue among shift workers was lowered. So that basically makes the third item in the list of things that were reduced not parallel to the first two things in the list. So just the, the reduced things in choice E end up not being parallel because of this, um, because, because of was lowered. By reintroducing a verb that was already introduced before with have reduced, it, re it ruins the parallelism and ruins the answer choice. Choice C, uh, concise. Not what we predicted, 
but does um, correctly separate the two um, lists of things, the things that were reduced and the thing that was raised. Page 682, question number 135. Spanning more than 50 years, Friedrich Müller began his career in an unpromising apprenticeship as a Sanskrit scholar and culminated in virtually every honor that European governments and learned societies could bestow. Okay. Uh, here's our friend. I'm glad this one came up again before the end of the series of broadcasts. Remember, we have this opening modifying phrase... A comma and the noun and uh, depending on which thing is underlined um, in this case it's the noun that is underlined whatever noun follows that comma needs to be the thing that is modified by the modifying phrase so the modifying phrase not negotiable spanning more than 50 years whatever it is that's after the comma needs to be spanning more than 50 years Friedrich Müller is, is what follows the comma. And while I suppose metaphorically you could say that a person spans 50 years, normally it would be their lifetime or their career that spans 50 years. So um, right out, we can cross off any answer choice that begins with the word Müller. Um, it's supposed to be a little mouth there. So it needs to be his career or his life or something like that. So that's one issue. Um, began his career in an unpromising apprenticeship as a Sanskrit scholar. Well, okay, and so then the other thing it looks like, whenever you see the word as, you should predict trouble. You know, reach for your revolver and be ready to shoot at whatever comes up in these other answer choices. Um, because as is trouble. Um, remember that because... The GMAT likes to confuse the use of like and as. Um, uh, it also likes to, that's a versus, as versus like. It also likes to confuse uh, the issue of parallelism. You know, something is as something else. And also it's just used in um, incorrectly in some idioms. Like something is compared as something else as opposed to compared to or, you know, things like that. So as has multiple wrong uses on the GMAT, and we need to make sure that this is correct. Uh, in the sentence as written, um, an unpromising apprenticeship as a Sanskrit scholar is correct. Okay, so the apprenticeship was in the role of a Sanskrit scholar. That's one of the meanings of as, you know, um, you know Christian Bale as Batman you know, or you know, Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. I don't know why I picked two, su two superhero movies, but that's the way it goes. Anyway, um, when you have somebody in a role, you can have X as Y. And that's what's going on here. So choice A has that part correct, but it is missing out on the correct modification of, um, it has its modifying phrase, you know, spanning more than 50 years, but it decides to focus on Friedrich Mueller rather than his life or his career. So choice A is wrong for reason number one. Let's take a look. Well, actually, let's just go down the list and cross off the other ones that just have Friedrich Mueller as our thing modified. So B has Mueller's career. C has Mueller's career. Uh, D has Mueller. Okay, so get rid of that one. And E... <laughs> uh, wait, uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh. Um, choice E, I think, is assuming that you will forget that the first word or the last word of the not underlined portion, per, not underlined portion, is the word Friedrich. So if you read choice E into the sentence, it's spanning more than fifty years. Friedrich, the career of Mueller, um, has begun. Okay, well, so you know that's totally not it. Um, also, there's has begun to. And it has this weird division. It divides the guy's name. Friedrich the Career Mueller. Like he's, you know, he's got his nickname, Friedrich the Career. They call him the Career. Anyway, uh, weird division. Oh, it's only one division. I don't need an S on there. Anyway, choice E, very, very, very wrong. So we really have to, and so choice A had the Mueller problem. So we have to decide between B and C. 
Spanning more than 50 years, Mueller's career began in an unpromising apprenticeship as, sounds good, let's check C. Uh, spanning more than 50 years, Friedrich Mueller's career began with the unpromising apprenticeship of being a Sanskrit scholar. So of being, really, there's no good reason. In fact, I don't think you can actually even say an apprenticeship of Apprenticeship of, no, I, I mean, I'm, I, I can't think of a, a sentence in English where you would want to use of there, let alone being. So, I mean, choice C kicks itself out uh, a couple ways. Uh, began with, um, also with is a little bit, um, a little bit suspect. I think this one's a little bit better, but really you would expect just began with a bang or began um, yeah, you would want something less metaphorical, uh, a less metaphorical use of with on the GMAT. In real life, people use with all the time in these more vague contexts, but the GMAT is not real life. Anyway, choice B is the only one that doesn't um, either have a Mueller error, a crazy from planet Mars answer like E, or uh, this wordy, you know, unpromising apprenticeship of being. I mean, yikes. So choice B, correct one for 135. 682, question number 136. Whereas in mammals, the tiny tubes that convey nutrients to bone cells are arrayed in parallel lines, in birds, the tubes form a, par a random pattern. Most of the sentences, sentences underlined, which of course is more work for us, um, you know, but of course this screams comparison. And we need to compare like things. Uh, so the two issues of comparison you know, uh, the comparisons need to be parallel grammatically. And they need to compare uh, similar things. As we start the sentence, choice uh, in, in uh, 136, um, in mammals, the tiny tubes are X. In birds, the tubes Y. So the sentence as written, um, So um, this looks really parallel, okay? We have both the parallel construction in mammals, tubes do this, in birds, tubes do that. Um, we're comparing what the tubes do. We have the same prepositional phrase with in. Um, really, choice A does look pretty good. Let's actually just see what the other ones do. Maybe um, the errors will be obvious. So choice B, whereas the tiny tubes for the conveying of nutrients to bone cells are arrayed in mammals in parallel lines, birds have tubes. Okay, so here the comparison is not uh, between similar things. The subject of the first part of the comparison is tubes. The second part, which is where the comma starts, we are comparing tubes versus birds. We need to compare tubes to tubes or mammals to birds. So choice B, not parallel. Also, it is a little bit wordy. The tubes for the conveying of nutrients. The conveying of nutrients. Normally, um, when, uh, when the GMAT tries to express purpose, it does not like to use for, for you know, with the gerund. It doesn't like to use for plus the gerund. Uh, to, to express purpose, so that's another problem with B, but the lack of parallelism parallelism in alone, um, uh, not grammatical parallelism, more like, um, what would be the word? Semantic parallelism, sorry, it, the meanings of the words, you know, the, the things being compared need to have a enough similarity that you could compare the two. Tubes and birds don't have a lot in common. Anyway, choice C, Unlike mammals, where the tiny tubes for conveying nutrients to bone cells are arrayed um, in parallel lines, birds' tubes. So this one is comparing mammals to birds' tubes. Again, not a parallel comparison, not a right answer. Uh, choice D, um, unlike mammals, in whom the tiny tubes that convey nutrients to bone cells 
are arrayed in parallel lines, the tubes in birds. Mammals versus tubes. Still not parallel. And choice E, um, unlike the tiny tubes that convey nutrients to bone cells, which in mammals are arrayed in parallel lines, in birds the tubes do this. So this one, um, in terms of sense, it is actually comparing tubes to tubes. Grammatically, though, it's not parallel. So we're saying, unlike the tiny tubes, um, so we're comparing tubes um, to tubes. So that part's the same. Grammatically, though, we have unlike the tubes, in birds the tubes. So we don't have the parallel in construction. Um, we have in birds, but then just tubes in the first part for mammals. So that part's the part that's not parallel in E. Choice A, then, is the one that was the most parallel originally and stays the most parallel for the duration. OK, <clears throat> last page, page 683. I don't know if you're happy to be getting to the end of your official guide. Um, and unless you're uh, taking the GMAT very soon, this should not be the last time that you crack this book open. I do highly recommend uh, that people come back to the official guide and do questions again. Hopefully you haven't written all over it. Uh, do questions again and read explanations after you've done more practices from, from other sources. Um, this really provides a solid grounding for uh, what the GMAT expects. Um, you, you cannot necessarily use this as a complete Bible of everything that could appear on the GMAT because there are um, questions and or, uh, ideas and issues that are mentioned in the kind of preparatory matter where they say, hey, here's some of the grammar stuff we expect you to learn. They don't necessarily, and especially on the quant side, they give you information in there that they don't necessarily have questions for in, um, in the question banks, you know, in the book. They sometimes touch on it, but they don't always give you a lot. Uh, so, you know, you can't use the questions alone as a basis for what they might expect you to know, but it's a really good basis, you know, and there's no source closer to what you could expect on the test. So, um, long story short, you're going to come back to this book, aren't you? Anyway, number 137, more names for me to mangle. Um, Joachim Raff and Giacomo Meyerbeer are examples of the kind of composer who receives popular acclaim while living, often goes into decline after death, and never regains popularity again. So we actually have a list in this one. We have um, kind of composer who receives a claim. That's an S. Um, goes into decline and never regains popularity. And we do have an and. OK. Issues here. One, of course, is regain again. Unless you're talking about regaining something a second time, um, like you've already regained something once, again is redundant. To regain means to get something back. Okay, So you don't actually need to say the word again in there because it's, impl it's built into the word regain. So redundant. Choice A has that, has the again, which we don't need. Um, the other issue here. Um, is the idea of a composer going into decline after death. Arguably, everybody goes into decline after death, OK? It's not actually the composer who should be going into decline after death. It should be um, the reputation or the popularity of the composer that goes into decline after the death of the composer, OK? so. Um, I suppose it could be making this just kind of, you know, 
I don't know, existential statement about uh, people going into decline after they cease to exist, but, um, you know, probably that's not what the sentence is going for. So we don't really want, um, we, need, we need the uh, popularity to go into decline, not the composer. Um, and those are, those, those are the two things that jump out at me. Let's see what turns up in the answer choices. We already knocked out A by reason of choices one and two, um, the death thing. Let's check B, um, whose reputation declines after death and never regains its status again. Okay, so uh, definitely it's got the again issue, which is redundant. Uh, and I think we can get rid of that for that reason. Choice B, or C, sorry, um, but whose reputation declines after death and never regains its former status. Well, it, it uh, we get rid of the again. It also has this word but here. Um, there is actually a contrast. We're trying to say that these two composers are examples of the kind of composer who's popular while alive, um, but whose reputation um, uh, declines uh, after the death of the composer. So having the addition of but actually adds contrast to a sentence that is implying contrast. So C is a pretty good option. Choice D, a kind of composer who receives popular acclaim while, while living, who declines in reputation after death, and who never regained popularity again. Well, the tense, this isn't anything I predicted, the tense of regains. Tense, namely regained. Because we're making a general statement about what happens, to certain types of composers. There are kinds of composers for whom this happens. When you're, when you're making general statements, you know, when it rains, I get wet, you use the present tense for all the verbs. So having regained uh, makes this no longer a um, general statement about certain kinds of composers and instead becomes um, a general statement about a certain type of composer that no longer exists. Like maybe there used to be kinds of composers who were popular when alive, but then never regained popularity, but now every composer is popular for all time. That does not seem likely, and certainly choice D then changes the meaning of the sentence. Choice D also has the dreaded again, again, so it's doubly wrong. Um, choice E, same thing. A um, couple things have, have weird tenses. Um, we have has declined. Two, two tense issues then has declined. Again, by making it um, anything other than present, it becomes more of a factual statement about these two men's lives, which is not what we're after. We're just using them as examples of types of composers who pop there while living unheard of after they die. Um, and then we also have regained as a tense issue. And so it doesn't have the again, but it has these two strange tenses when really we want present tense verbs for all of it. Okay, so choice C, um, the one that jumped out at us before with this very surprising and exciting word, but providing contrast, uh, also gets rid of the extra again and um, shifts the focus to the reputation of the composer rather than the composer him or herself. I mean, I, those are both guys' names, but um, you know, it could have been, it could apply to female composers just as easily. Anyway, choice C is our correct answer. Uh, Six eighty-three, number one thirty-eight. In no other historical sighting did Halley's Comet cause such a worldwide sensation as did its return in nineteen ten to nineteen eleven. Okay. So, um, we're comparing two things. We are comparing um, sightings, or the sensations in sightings of Halley's Comet. And so, we again, we have this comparison. And again, they need to be uh, parallel grammatically. And, um, and in sense. We need to compare like things. 
So, you know, in terms of grammatical, we would expect, um, and this is uh, present somewhat in um, choice A, in, um, we would want parallelism with the preposition in. You know, we have in 1910 um, uh, to 1911 versus in any other historical citing. So we want that. Um, we also want to compare the two, um, in, uh, compare two things sensibly. So in no other historical citing did Halley's Comet uh, cause, such a, world, uh, cause uh, such a worldwide sensation as did its return. So choice A is comparing the comet versus its return, which is not parallel. So we don't want A. Um, so choice B, same thing, comet versus the return. Also, there's this verb had, helping verb had. And when you, when, you, when you are just repeating just the helping verb as opposed to the entire verb, because really what we're saying is in no other historical sighting did Halley's Comet cause such a worldwide sensation as it did cause. So uh, did is um, an ellipsis. Greek word that means a leaving out, um, did equals did cause. So we are to insert the word cause again. Um, and in choice B, then we can't really insert the word cause. Um, such a worldwide sensation as had caused its 1910 to 1911 return. So had is a problem with B. <clears throat> um, Choice C, in no other historical sighting did Halley's Comet cause such a worldwide sensation as in its return um, of 1910 and 1911. Notice that without the verb, uh, without repeating the helping verb, uh, we leave the focus on these two in phrases. So we're comparing the return versus the return. Because that's the issue. The comet like goes off, does comedy business for a while, and then circles back to where it's visible to the Earth. And then everyone's like, ooh, hey, it's a comet, OK? Um, and so here we're actually comparing returns versus returns, so that's good. Um, uh, or actually, actually, I think it's comet versus comet. Oh, dear. Grammatically, it's the comet in its return versus the comet in its return. So uh, pretend I didn't say that. Anyway, it's parallel is the main issue here. OK, choice D. Um, again, we can see by the introduction of the verb, it becomes comet versus return again. And um, And then choice E, by just having its return in 1911, we lack the parallelism of the two in phrases. So choice E, also not parallel. So basically every one of these, oh wait, this one is parallel. Oops, I forgot that sometimes I write things on the correct answers. All the other answer choices not parallel. Choice C is the one that is parallel. Penultimate question, page 683, number 139. The company announced that its profits declined much less in the second quarter than analysts had expected it to, and its businesses and its business will improve in the second half of the year. So uh, remember things to, that to be suspicious of on the GMAT whenever you see the word it. Be worried that it is not referring clearly to a single thing or that it's a, a uh, noun pronoun mismatch. So in this particular case, um, the profits declined less than analysts had expected it to. Okay, so it does not equal profits. It should be them. The, the analysts had expected them to. The other one is the verb tense here. Analysts had expected. This is one of those, you know, past perfect tense things. Remember, you see the past perfect tense only when it's something that took place before a main verb in the past tense. So company announced, 
past tense, um, profits declined less than analysts had expected. So the expectation that analysts, you know, analysts said, hey, we expect profits to uh, decline a whole lot. They said that, then the company announced, and, and both of these things take place in the past tense. So the verb tense had expected is correct in choice A, um, even though the it is not. Um, but, I, you know, again, in terms of predictions, the correct use of the past perfect tense is one of the things that they often, you know, they push that button a bunch of times whenever that one comes up. And let's see. Oh, the second it. Um, so I meant it's plural. It does not equal profits, but it's business, as in ITS, equals the company. So the second it's is fine. And choice A has that one um, just fine. Um, oh yeah, one more that I can see just looking at it. So when you talk about predictions in the past tense, the word will is the present tense of, of a prediction. The past tense of a prediction is would, the past tense of the, of the verb will. You know, I say today it will be snowy tomorrow. I said yesterday it would be snowy today. So would is the past tense of the verb will in addition to being kind of that conditional word too. So uh, the word will because it's, um, the, because the company announced Ignoring the first half of what the company announced, it announced that that its business will improve. It should be the company announced that its business would improve because the 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 company saying our business will improve happened in the past tense. So the company said our business would improve. Anyway, so the other issue then is will with choice A. Okay, let's see what the other answer choices do to fix or mess with these issues. Um, B. Um, profits declined much less in the second quarter than analysts had expected and that its business would improve. So that second its refers to company, not profits. Uh, we still have the had expected that we had expected. Um, and I guess it's, I should have just said expected because my main verb was have. Correcting your grammar while you're speaking, pretty lame. Although I guess since I'm speaking to the internet about grammar, I should be more careful. Anyway, um, choice B then has all of these things that we expected in a correct form, so we'll, we'll keep B as an option. Uh, choice C, much less in the second, profits declined much less in the second quarter than analysts expected it would and that it will improve its business. Yikes. Okay, so the first it should be them because it refers to profits in choice C. Um, and then it will improve its business. We're talking about the company here. The company will improve its business. That means something different from business will improve. Business will improve, as a phrase, means that the company is expecting sales or revenues or just general transactions to be more favorable to the company in number or in um, some other uh, quality. Uh, to improve your business implies more of an inward looking, like they're going to restructure or something like that. It, business is a really vague word, and improve your business means something different. So, or could mean something different, and because it could mean something different very clearly, like there's not, if this isn't an obscure meaning of improve your business, um, that makes it unclear what they're saying. And you know how the GMAT hates lack of clarity. Sorry for this extra sloppy writing, the pen is, getting a little... Sometimes when the computer is running background processes, it um, doesn't write as clearly. Anyway, uh, choice D, uh, profits declined much less in the second quarter than analysts expected, the, expected them to, and its business would improve. Um, so we needed had expected. Actually, that was true of C, too. Lots of things wrong with C. D, we need the, 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 the verb tense had expected. Actually, just looking down, choice E also has the had expected issue. We need the past perfect tense to go prior to the verb announced. 
and and that it, it, it will have improved its business. So here we have the improved business phrase, which is problematic. So choice B, um, much less than analysts had expected and that its business would improve is our correct answer. Okay, whoops, wrong color. Last question, page 683 number 140. And after we're done with this, I'll check the Facebook page or, you know, the video page where there's the comments underneath to see if anybody has any questions, depending on how much time there is left. Rock samples taken from the remains of an asteroid about twice the size of the six mile wide asteroid that eradicated the dinosaurs has been dated to be 3.47 billion years old and thus is evidence of the earliest known asteroid impact on Earth. Long sentence separating the subject and the verb, uh, always be suspicious that there is a subject verb mismatch on this one. And so here, uh, the subject of the sentence is rock samples. Rock samples verb has been dated. Clearly, we need the word have because it's plural. So rock samples have been dated. So uh, choice A ha needs have and is wrong. Um, the other thing we can expect is the idiom. Date, so it has dated to be. We need at. So there's another idiom there that we need corrected. Um, well, those are the only ones that jump out at me because those are the only things I see wrong with choice A. Let's look at the other answers. Um, uh, rock samples has been dated. Well, same issue there. Um, at 3.47 billion years old and thus, it, and thus evidence well. It's also missing the word is or are actually because we're trying to say that the rock samples have been dated and are evidence of the earliest known asteroid impact. So uh, we do need that second verb because we're saying rock samples are two things. They've been dated and that they are evidence. Uh, choice C, have been dated to be 3.47 billion years old and thus are. So we need uh, at rather than to be in choice C. Choice D, have been dated as being 3.47 billion years old and thus. So we're missing the at and the r, not d. So it should be choice e for our last one here, but let's just see what it does. Uh, rock samples have been dated at 3.47 billion years old and thus are evidence of the earliest known asteroid impact on Earth. So choice e does correct the issues that we saw and uh, does not introduce new errors. Thank you, choice e. All right, I'm going to check the Facebook page to see if anybody has any um, last minute questions. Unlike yesterday, I actually um, got the page up in advance, so no, no questions. Okay. Um, all right. Well, thanks for joining us for on uh, Grocket.com, uh, the OG TV program helps if I have the pen going. Um, this is the twelfth edition to the. This was the twelfth edition to the guide to the test. Um, quite possibly, when there's a new edition, you may see a new edition of OG TV. My name's Jim Jacobson. You can look for me on Grocket.com. I'm available for tutoring and stuff like that. And um, thanks for joining us. Good luck on the test whenever it is that you're taking it. And if you're watching this on video, hello from the past. And yeah, hope to see you around on the site. Send me a message. Say hi.